Our next panel session is uh, on Internet of Things. It's going to be headed by Harold. Harold is the uh, editor and founder of uh, MLove. He also is a co-founder of Smarto, which is um, a mobile advertising pioneer in San Francisco. He's also been named the top 50 CMO in Twitter by Social Media Marketing and also has been called the Marketing Maven by NBC. Please welcome Harold to the stage. Okay. Thank you again. Good morning, everybody. Um, seems like one or two had a uh, good night and uh, half of Barcelona is still out there somewhere in traffic. But I think this is uh, probably the most exciting panel I think we will hear this whole week. Um, I'm really excited about this to share the stage with uh, three really uh, amazing innovators and distinguished uh, yeah, pioneers in the Internet of Things and everything which is probably in front of us uh, and the next wave of mobility, I think, when everything goes smaller and faster and so on. Uh, the first speaker up will be uh, Dr. Genevieve Bell, and she is a researcher with the, um, R within the R&D department of Intel, and she is an um, educated, um, academic, greatest career uh, in uh, a background in anthropo anthropology. Um, so she has a very... Um, let's say, human view on our technology, and this is very close to our heart and what we are, uh, what drives us. After that, uh, we have Massimo uh, Banzi, who is the founder and creator of Arduino. Uh, it's like very democratizing movement of uh, bringing technology and chips and the Internet of Things in the hands of masses of makers. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Jerome um, Nadell, and he is the CMO of uh, uh, Rambos, which is also a pioneering company from the early days of computing and now uh, a driving force in all services, security and sensors um, in the Internet of Things. And I think this whole panel will be giving you and us a great, um, let's say, insights about the discussion and we will, you know, note some of the questions for the panel later. Without further ado, let me introduce you to Dr. Genevieve Bell. Thank you. Just like magic, I love that. Hi, my name's Genevieve. Thank you for that incredibly gracious introduction, Harold. Uh, I thought what would be kind of fun to do here was talk a little bit about what is, for me, the other side of the Internet of Things. So we spend a lot of time talking about the Internet of Things, and as a research social scientist, I'm interested in all the stuff we're not talking about about people, about the places where this internet of things will happen, about the sort of the objects that will become smart in this whole story. So I thought what I'd do is spend about 10 minutes kind of talking through where I think some of the interesting opportunities and challenges are. Harold gave you a brief introduction to me. It is indeed correct. I was an academic before. I have a PhD in cultural anthropology. I'm also the child of an anthropologist, so I spent my childhood living in central and northern Australia with indigenous people who remembered their country before Europeans came. And so in many ways, I had an idyllic childhood. I didn't wear shoes, I didn't speak English, I got to kill everything around me and then eat it for supper. Um, this is an excellent childhood. Most of those lessons have not stood me in good stead in industry thus far, which is probably for the best. Um, but my job at Intel is very much a job about bringing stories from outside the building into the building and using them to influence our future technology development. So I spend most of my time in people's homes all over the world, getting a sense of what makes them tick, what they care about, what frustrates them, what they want for themselves, their kids, their families, their communities, even their countries. And thinking about how you use all of those insights to shape next generation technology development. These days I have a team of about 100 people who work with me, a range of different backgrounds, in everything from anthropology like me to psychology, linguistics, sociology, economics, also industrial design, interaction design, human factors engineering, and then computer science and hardware and software design. And really what we're trying to do through all of those different kind of disciplines and contexts and competencies is find new ways to think about what the future of computing might bring. Mostly we do that by spending time with people in the places they make meaning in their lives, getting a sense of what they care about, and then building prototypes, testing those. Over the last couple of years, we've been working in, in some ways, the really obvious places. We've been looking at what people are doing with wearable computing. We've been looking at what people are doing in and around their cars. Those for us are a really interesting object. We've been thinking about how people are using data to quantify themselves, but also to engage with the world. 
And we've been continuing to think about what people do with their televisions and their phones and their computers. In all of that work, a couple of things have become really kind of clear to us about the things that people value and about the ways they sort of think about the world and also about the ways in which there is incredible and extraordinary difference that kind of traffics here. And for me, what I really want to do is kind of drill down on three of those things. So one of the things that became very clear to my team and I about a year ago as we started to hear conversations about the Internet of Things was that one of the first things that's missing from that phrase is people. There is just an internet of things. There's no one that is using it or being impacted by it or possibly not wanting to have it happen in their lives. And so for us, part of the first conversation we had in my lab was, well, how do you put people back into this story? And what would they be doing here if you did? So we went and looked at people who were starting to use new smart devices. We looked at people who were using Fitbit and Nike Fuel and Jawbone Up, so some of the early quantified self things. We started to look at people that were responsible for administering systems of the Internet of Things, so people who were responsible for big industrial temperature systems and climate-controlled systems. And one of the things that became really clear through all of that work is that very different kind of motivations will bring people to an acceptance of smart, connected objects in their worlds. Some of it's their job. They simply have to manage it. But managing it's never straightforward, because usually you're talking about a connected set of objects that have multiple owners, that have different structures and standards, and even different ways of plugging in. I mean, really pragmatic stuff. Where does it connect? What is the battery life? What does it mean when it has a sort of, in some ways, uh, unfamiliar lifetime of power? Everyone we talked to in the quantified self movement made it very clear to us very quickly that one of the problems with all of the technology they were wearing on their bodies was that it didn't require being charged every 24 hours, but it was more like every 72, sometimes 36, occasionally 48. And it turns out as human beings, we're not good at thinking about things that happen every two days or every three days, or sometimes every two and a half days. You make us do something every day, we're okay. You make us do something every week, put out the recycling, put out the trash, we can manage that. You make us do something once a month, we're not fabulous at it, but we can you know, kind of get the, our heads around it. Doing things every two or three days, deeply complicated. Just goes against all the, lo the laws we know about the way we think for the world, right? So starting to imagine how these objects will sit in our worlds means there are some things that as human beings we're used to that these devices haven't necessarily delivered up until now. And then there's all the other not unreasonable things that go with a world of smart connected objects that have to do with ideas about trust, privacy, security, risk, reputation. And we know from the time we've spent with people that all of those are things that people worry about in different ways. Ideas about trust and reputation look different in different countries, in different cultures, at different points in people's life cycles. So all of those things make it really complicated. So as soon as you say there are going to be humans in the Internet of Things, it gets very messy. And, you know, truthfully, as a researcher, I like that. As soon as you go to the second bit of the Internet of Things, which is the thing bit, when we say things, that sounds somehow so delightfully clean and simple. It's just things. And then you start to say, well, what are those things going to be? Some of them are going to be traffic lights. Some of them will be smart electrical meters. Some of them may be cars and buses and roads. I was at Mobile World Congress yesterday on the main stage, and there is more than one person selling smart connected toothbrushes. And I can start, yeah, I know. And I can start to tell you that once you connect toothbrushes, we are talking about a very wide landscape of things that will be made smart and connected. One of the challenges in that from an engineering point of view is how do you know what information moves from what object to what object and under what circumstances? Most of the engineers who work with me say that what they are looking for is seamless connectivity. Things should just seamlessly connect to one another. Now pause for a moment and think about that. You now have a smart connected toothbrush that can seamlessly connect to things. What would you like it to seamlessly connect to and what would you hope it shared when it did that? Imagine a more plausible scenario of the smartphone in your bag or in your pocket that when you come home, your home server in the cloud caches all the photos off that phone, stores them, backs them up, and broadcasts them on the biggest screen in your home because that's where we like to see photos. Now, we've been playing out that scenario with consumers for years, and every single consumer, age irrespective, looks at you and goes, that would not be a good idea. Now, I don't know what it is that you are all taking pictures of that you don't want stored and broadcast on the biggest screen in your home, but I can guess. 
And it turns out as we start to think about how you architect an internet of things, we're not architecting a flat world, right? We're architecting a world of objects that will have different meaning, different resonance, that require different levels of privacy, different levels of data security, different levels of connectivity. So hiding underneath the label, the internet of things, is this incredible complexity of what we are connecting to what, for what purpose. And oh, by the way, as the owners and operators, and in some ways the people who will experience this, this is not simply gonna be a matter of opting in to every device, because that's a non-scalable strategy. And you can't opt into every device at every moment you encounter them, so that's also not scaling. So we have some really interesting challenges here about what this looks like. In the third space for us, which we continue to think is really interesting as researchers, is also where are these things going to be, right? When we talk about a smart connected world, we hear a lot of conversations about smart cities, smart homes. The reality is that making Istanbul smart is a very different proposition than making London smart, is a completely different proposition than making Sydney or Cleveland smart. Those are cities that have different histories, different regulations, different infrastructure, different built environments, different habits and practices and citizens and rules, both social tacit rules and governmental rules. And as we start to think about connecting up things in worlds, all of those worlds are going to have different challenges attendant to them. Some of them are physical and material. It's one thing to connect a world of stone buildings that are 600 years old. It's something very different to connect fiberboard ones that are 10 years old. It's just different mechanics, right? Some of it's about what does it mean to connect a suburb in the kind of classic American model of large freestanding buildings with huge open grounds around them is a very different proposition than high density apartment complexes. All of those things will create challenges here. Likewise, you know, what it is that people imagine the motivation will be. It's one thing to say you want to make a city smart because you're interested in sustainability or environmental issues or traffic flows. It's another thing to say you want to make it smart because you're interested in security and safety. Those may require two very different instrumentations with very different implications for the back end, but also for the distribution of what the things on the end look like. So for us as, as researchers and arguably technologists, there's an enormous lot of, I would say, interesting things hiding underneath the label, the Internet of Things. And frankly, you know, what the Internet of Things does as a, a tagline is it tidies up a lot of mess. But the mess is the stuff that's interesting. So for me, as I think about the next sort of three to five to ten years, I know four is the, the number I should be thinking of, the next four years, <laughs> lurking underneath the Internet of Things is all this really fascinating stuff. The materiality of life, the reality that it has to touch down in a real world, not in a lab and not in someone's fantasy. But for me, that's actually when the opportunities are most exciting and interesting. So I just wanted to put a brief plug in here for my company. Uh, we are really interested in this space. We're particularly interested in the wearable space. And at CES this year, we launched a competition to invite people to come and build on our technology, the next generation of wearable tech. Uh, we have about a million dollars in prize money sitting here underneath these competitions. Uh, we would love you to come and bring your good ideas and help shape this part of the Internet of Things with us. That would be fabulous. So please you know, feel free to log on and play. And then last but not least, you can find me on Twitter. Should this not have been enough, there is more of me there. So with that, I say thank you and look back to the lovely Harold. <laughs>